Hello and welcome to another episode of Geopolitica. My name is Rodolfo Ragonesi and on the program today we have um, Jason Giardina. Hello. How are you, Jason? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Rudolf. Not at all. Okay, so today um, in this episode we are going to be talking about uh, discussing the protection and care of our children. Um, something which is obviously to everyone's heart, I think, the protection of um, the young in society is something of tremendous importance in all uh, creatures, of course, uh, specifically us humans. So, um, Jason, yes, we're going to start talking about, uh, I would say, kicking off on the definition of children. The, the law generally has defined minors or children as being persons who are under 18. This is what the civil law says. This is the definition according to civil law. However, then there are other laws um, such as the, the criminal code referring to the defilement of minors where the definition of minors is now persons who are under 16. So this is different from the definition in the civil code. There's also the gender identity and gender expression and sex characterization um, characteristics act of 2015 which also defines uh, minors or uh, ch children as persons under 16. So this is an important distinction even in the law itself. For these purposes uh, the age of minors is seen to be as under 16. For other things, it would be under 18. Uh, I think it's important that we start um, uh, explaining the nature and contents of this law that has created a bit of debate in society, not just in Malta but uh, elsewhere, and ask a number of questions regarding the consequences of this law, the gender identity law, to, to name it in short. I think the first thing that we need to uh, lay down is to establish who are the guardians of these minors. Right. One thing that has come out recently is that there have been statements in, uh, in the public domain stating that the protection of children or the guardianship of children lies with the state. This, from a legal point of view, is absolutely nonsensical. Well, and it also flips the, the definition of what a democratic state is because the state belongs to the people, not the other way around. So yes, precisely. It's not that children belong to, to the state, it's that the state belongs to the people who, who uh, vote in the uh, definers of, or the people who determine the law of the state. So parents, the children obviously belong to the parents. I, that should be sacrosanct. Well, not belong. The guardianship, the law is very clear. The guardianship of children is entrusted in the parents. This has not changed. And this is in the Constitution, not just in any sub-law, is, that, is exactly. that correct? Exactly. This has not changed. Well, it's, it's been in, in the established laws, in the body of laws. Mm -hmm including in the civil law. The guardianship is entrusted on the, in the parents. Right. The moment you start um, moving away from that concept and say that the guardian is the state, you are moving towards totalitarianism. That's right. Because this is the problem where the state starts to rule people's lives to the point where civil liberties are being impinged because the, it is the state that is dictating how people should be living their lives. Whereas we, the state is there to protect the state from uh, foreign, foreign enemies <clears throat> and incursions. That's right. And to try to steer the economy and steer society. But steering is not becoming the guardian That's of right. minors, the, the guardian of children. The, the guardians remain the parents. This is the starting point of any debate. The electorate vote in politicians to, to serve the electorate, not to, to, to rule them. I mean, that is, should be a fundamental principle yes. of all democracy. Essentially, it's the people who are sovereign. It is not the people who are in government, who are serving the people right. who are sovereign. It is the people themselves who are sovereign. That's the fundamental principle of any democracy. Right. 
So, um, so I think the second point would be if we go into the uh, this this new law, the gender identity law um, of two thousand and fifteen. It starts off by giving a definition of of what constitutes gender identity. The definition is that gender identity refers to each person's internal and individual experience of gender which may or may not correspond with the sex assigned at birth. So this is what this law is specifically about. Now, the definition according to this law itself is saying that gender identity, as seen by the law, is a matter of perception of the individual. Now, I'm not going to go into the merits or otherwise of the law, but we need to explain and ask where this is leading. So if I can interrupt you for just a second, I remember going when I was just a child, um, the term gender wasn't really in the public vocabulary. It was you, when you were asked to fill out a form, you were asked for your sex, male or female. Uh, and the reason that gender was never really in the, in the um, public domain was because there is obviously quite a, a large body of work within the social sciences which links gender, gender expression to sex. So there was re really no discussion as to whether you were a male but identified as a female because that really that whole notion didn't really exist. We're talking 40, 45 years In other years words, the, the, the two net words, sex and gender, were, were interlinked. Were interlinked where they were used uh, in, uh, to inter refer to, that's the, to right. the same thing. And now exactly. they are um, we're reaching a point where they have different definitions. That's right. And this is why the law here, the 2015 law, is giving a specific um, uh, uh, definition to the word gender or gender identity as opposed to possibly the word sex. Um, however, what we know from a physical, scientific perspective is that you cannot change the actual sex of a person. The law is talking about the perception of the, of the gender identity, but you can't actually change a sex physically. If we get down to the fundamental principle of what is uh, someone's sex, it's the XXXY chromosome. This cannot be changed. This is inherent in, in, in the human body. Yes. From a scientific perspective, there are, there are various benchmarks. There are the chromosomes, there's the secretion of hormones. In this case, we're talking either testosterone or, or estrogen. Humans, whatever the gender, whatever the sex, secrete both, but in different um, quantities. So men secrete more testosterone and women secrete more estrogen. And then you've got the body parts, the, the, the reproductive organs, right. um, the sex organs. And regardless of what you are changing externally when it comes to appearance, the anatomy of the body internally cannot change. Exactly. So I identify as a male. My birth certificate has identified me from birth as a male. I cannot change that to a female. I'm speaking now legally, but based on scientific facts. To the point where I can never have children. I cannot, the, the science doesn't allow the possibility to, to organize uh, me in, in or reorganize, reshape exactly. me in such a way that I could have a, a womb, a uterus and uh, ovaries and that I can actually bear children right. and vice versa. So really, the, the, the technical scientific definition of what constitutes a male or a female <sighs> cannot change. What can change according to this law is how you identify yourself as, as a gender. But physically, scientifically, you cannot change the anatomical structure. You can change the external parts that are associated with. So there is a difference between scientific fact and perception. 
If people have a perception of their gender, it's one thing to argue perception of gender. But to actually argue that you're going to ch physically, scientifically change what constitutes a male body or a female body, that is incorrect. That is not possible. So given that background information, what exactly is the what exactly are we doing here with this legislation? When we propose that we can transform a child, and we are talking about children here, um, from one sex to another, uh, what exactly are we doing? Are we just simply mutilating these children for for ideological or political purposes? Well, this is a very interesting uh, point, an interesting question, because of course the subject matter of today is not. Um, gender identity per se, the subject matter and debate is the protection of children. So regardless of laws on gender identity, right. we are talking about the protection of children. When it comes to the protection of children, uh, the, the, the question arises whether you are the state or the school educating children or the guardians, how should you approach the nature of, of sex and sexuality and when to children in order to protect children. Because mm. if we are protecting children from undue influences, that also um, is referring to undue influences regarding sex when children are not necessarily considered by their guardians to be at a sufficient age in order to embark on these, these, these debates or discussions right. or education. We are influencing, influencing them in, um, in a way which could sway them one way or another. So if we have, let's say, a naturally heterosexual child, but are presenting to them notions of sexuality, which may or may not be congruent with their natural sexuality, we could sway them from let's say, heterosexuality, heterosexuality saying, well, maybe I am uh, not exactly as my gender uh, is supposed to be, but as another gender should be. And so we could possibly be swaying them both ways from heterosexuality to, or from a boy into a girl, from a girl into a boy, from heterosexual into homosexuality, from homosexuality into heterosexuality. Because when we are conflating these two issues, sex and gender, to a child who doesn't understand what sexuality is because their sexuality hasn't manifested, we are in their mind, in this very young, impressionable mind, mixing up what it is to be a boy and what it is to be a heterosexual boy versus a homosexual boy, boy and girl and vice versa. So we are really um, making a mess of this whole situation at, at such a tender age when we really should, in my opinion, we should be leaving them to allow their sexuality to manifest. And then when they're able to understand what sexuality and what gender and what sex is, that they can make up their own mind. Yes, I think it's a question of, of undue influence and when one should um, start to influence or educate. Because again, there is a, what constitutes education and what constitutes uh, influence. And the question is also... You can't really draw the line because the moment you, 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 you approach, uh, you broach a subject, you are influencing someone. Mm -hmm. So the obvious question is, at what age is a child considered to be um, old enough, mature enough to engage in a certain type of education? And without answering that question myself, because that would be a matter of opinion, right. again, I would refer to the first point that we raised is, who is to make that decision? Well, that, I was, that's because what I, that decision is the decision of the guardian. The law is very clear right, that exactly. it is the guardian that makes the decision. So what recourse do parents have in this regard? It's because, the, as you said, the law is pretty clear. The, the parents have a, a, a legal right to determine what is taught to their children. But it seems as though, and there are instances where, for example, um, parents are not being allowed to uh, obtain the curriculum uh, in certain courses which are teaching this type of um, ideology. So what is what recourses do parents have in order to say, listen, I don't want this taught to my children at that age? For well, before, before going into the um, matter of recourse, I think we need to, to determine whether that is, is right or wrong. Okay. Um, if, if guardians have the, the right of guardianship, the responsibility of guardianship over children, 
then schools or the state in general has no right whatsoever to withhold information to the guardians. You cannot withhold information, whether it's regards um, education or any other activity which is taking place in the education environment. You cannot keep the guardians in the dark. That is the first point. So people, before knowing what recourse there could be, they need to know their rights yeah. and obligations. The, the schools have an obligation to be transparent and to keep the parents who are the legal guardians according to the law, to keep them in the loop and to keep them fully informed of their curricula, of the books they use, um, and the contents of the education. If they do not, then they are hiding something. And it, it begs the obvious question, why are they withholding information well, from the guardians? That leads to this question, which I, I've been wanting to ask you is, how do we know, how, how can we be certain that, um, that the schools are not hiding this type of information due to uh, pressure from uh, legislators, from politicians from school boards to not well we don't not release that we information. don't know that but the whole the whole idea of procedures in law procedures regarding transparency is to prevent such things happening so if you have full transparency and the school has an obligation to give this information then that information has to be given regardless of whether the school is withholding information on its own bat or because it's under influence from another party, you know, it, it, it becomes irrelevant because they are under obligation to give that information. Mm -hmm. And therefore, correspondingly, parents have every right, a sacrosanct right, to demand that information and, and to take the role and to keep and maintain the role as guardians, guardians of education for their children. So if children do not feel, sorry, if the parents do not feel that it is appropriate, rightly or wrongly. It's not an opinion I am, I am uh, uh, giving myself what they should or should not do. But the point remains that if a specific parent considers anything to be inappropriate regarding the education of his or her child, mm -hmm. then it is the right of that parent to step in and say, listen, regarding this aspect of, of, of education. I'm not comfortable with right. this. You know, I don't feel that my child is of sufficient age to be exposed to this form of uh, information, this form of education, regardless of the subject matter. We're not talking about specifically gender identity mm -hmm. issues. Right. We're talking about anything. This, you have to start from these principles. If you start breaking down the, the fundamental principles of who is the guardian, what rights the guardian has, whether the guardian has a right to say, listen, I don't feel that this is appropriate for my child at the child's age, whatever the subject happens to be, then you've got a major problem. You see? Mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, you, um, you, you fulfill the, the, the requirements of law and you grant these rights, then automatically this, the, the problem doesn't arise. Whether it happens to be a gender uh, identity education issue or something else, the problem doesn't arise, you see? Mm. So you have to see the, what the primary problem is. The primary problem is not whether there is um, a difference of opinion between parents and schools right. or, or the education department regarding gender identity issues being taught to children. That is not the primary problem. That is the secondary problem. The primary problem is who is being recognized as the guardian of the children, Exactly. what rights do the guardians have when they have a disagreement. That is the primary issue. The secondary issue would then be the merits of, 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 of the um, matter at hand, right. whether it happens to be gender identity, whether it happens to be something else. Now you've read, you've read the act, yes? So yes. Can, should we talk about um, the elements of the act which are a specific concern? Yes, of course. I think the first thing of, of specific concern, um, and this is why I, I read the definition of what constitutes gender identity, is in fact this. Because if the law is saying that gender identity is, is largely a matter of, of um, individual perception, so I'll read that again. 
identity refers to each person's internal and individual experience of gender. So that means that it is a matter of perception of the individual. Now, there have been certain sources that have claimed to have come up with another 72 definitions, forms of gender identity. And this is something of supreme importance because it begs the question, who has the right within science, social science, within the law, to come up with 72 or 10 or 15 or 100 definitions of gender identity? Who, who is the ultimate source of information, the right. power, to come up with this, with this list? And does it make sense to have 72 gender identities? And the fact that we have 72 I gender identities kind of flies in the face of this very common notion that one is born their sexuality. So someone, someone is born straight or someone is born gay. So it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. It's, if someone is born that way and therefore on that notion, we base this, this, this law that one cannot be um, um, persuaded to change their sexuality. We have this law now in Malta as well. If that is the case, if one is born then, that way, then how do we have, how can we have um, 72 genders which one can choose at a whim, uh, which gender they choose to be. You're either born that way or, or you have a choice. It's, you, I, I fail to see how you can have both situations simultaneously. Well, it certainly confuses the issue, not just uh, to the individual, but to society in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, today we have uh, this information available that there are claims, uh, including from some medicine uh, authority websites, that are claiming that there are 72 other gender identities. Right. Now, rightly or wrongly, I'm not going to go into the merits of whether they are right or wrong. Let us just follow the logic. If our law is saying that gender identity is largely a matter of perception and everyone has a right to his or her own perception of his or her own gender identity, then there is nothing stopping any persons in Malta from going on to a, such a website, looking at these 72 different gender identities and choosing one of them, and then going to, um, to a notary public and stating in, in, in the document to be drawn up which of those 72 identities he or she is, is, is choosing. And if there is any pushback from the state, from the registrar, who then is duty bound to change documentation accordingly and say, no, what, what we don't recognize that particular uh, one of the 72. We recognize, for example, 20 of them. Is that not creating a problem? Exactly. Because the law itself is already saying I have a right to uh, perceive my own form of gender identity and today, so so how long is a pair of is is, is is a piece of string with the sky is the limit if you have 500 gender identities eventually we've already jumped to 72 which right. is a, already a gargantuan number what if they become 500 exactly does that mean we've got a, a choice of 500 different types of of gender the identity that people can can um uh, associate with identify and with? who is the arbiter of that number who is the arbiter if today we have 500, let's say you've chosen f number 499, but let's say in a few days' time, in a few months' yes, time, exactly. we say, you know what, that 499, 500 genders, that's too many. We're going to narrow it down yes, to yes. 200. What happens yes. to now that you've got number And you number can't say that there are 492. It just happens to be a group of people mm -hmm. who, who have listed on their website, but this is, this is becoming uh, more recognized internationally, that now they are, are claiming there are 72. But according to whom? You know, was there an international symposium? Was there a vote taken? Was it, is it the general agreement of a body of scientists? And are these people representative? social scientists, are they representative? You know, I mean, who's taking decisions? That's right, are they yeah. representative of the, of the transgender community as a whole? And anyway, I mean, who are these people exactly? Well, this is it. I mean, how, how, how much are, are, are various communities being, uh, being consulted? Yes, so, this is another thing. So uh, there are too many things that are 
up in the air and vague. So we have a law. Remember that the word law means something that binds in society. Yeah? You've got in Italian the word legare, no? Yes. Legge is from, from legare. You're binding. So you're binding and defining. But if things are so fluidic, how can you, how can you bind them? How can you suddenly change these identities to the point where you don't really know how you're changing them? And because one day you have 70 definitions, another day you have 100. And you're creating chaos because... Uh, when you impose by legislation certain notions which are, are, are as you say, fluid and not uh, concrete or substantiated in logic, uh, you throw into chaos many structures in society. For example, if you have uh, a male individual who is um, who has been c accused of a crime, he could easily just say or choose to identify as a female and therefore as a female he might uh, get if he become if he's convicted of his crime be thrown into a female prison so now what we have a female let's say a, fe a male rapist cho choosing to identify as female into a female prison which is actually these situations are occurring uh, not locally in Malta but in places like the US and so you are you are throwing these these structures that we have in society in, into into chaos uh, you have for example sports um, sports where males are are, are are identifying as females and taking participating in female sports and vice versa we had situations in the, in in North America where we had a, a male athlete identifying as a female participating in uh, female mixed martial arts um, events and absolutely and crushing and crushing the these females and injuring them so I can't understand how advocates for this type of uh, for this type of ideology are not addressing this this because we're, we're having females who are getting hurt we're having females who are stripped of their abilities to perform at the top levels because we have males who are by nature stronger um, faster stronger yes. bone density who are who are um, just crushing, crushing the competition. And females aren't given the opportunity to uh, again. You go back participate. To, you go back to the law. The whole idea of putting a law together is to make sure it has as few loopholes as possible. Right. And no matter what law you pass, there are always going to be loopholes, and then you try to adjust it, etc. And they, these laws have opened up a lot of loopholes and a lot of questions. Some of which you've you've just raised. So. The obvious question is, if you don't have mixed prisons at this stage, maybe in the future they'll end up with mixed prisons. But if you've got a male prison and a female prison, are you not opening yourself up to a problem in society? If a male says, I now identify a person who was uh, recognized, let's say, as a male in society, according to documentation, is now saying, no, I'm identifying as a female. And therefore, the law obliges the state to put that person into a female prison. And another issue regarding loopholes is there's no um, limit to how many times you can change your mind. Right. So l let me speak for myself. Let's say I decide to identify as a female. Forget the other 72 uh, subdivisions of gender. Let's say the st standard, straightforward female gender. What's to stop me then re-identifying with a male a year later or six months later? Because I say, well, I now I no longer perceive myself as a female. I see I perceive myself as a male again. So I change. I can change 10 times, 20 times. So there's nothing in the law which is saying that once you've changed once, you can't change again. Doesn't say you have a maximum of five times to change. You know, because the thing about the principles of law is that you can do anything that the law um, does not prohibit. So if the, the new gender identity law allows you to make this change, unless there is a clause in the law saying that you cannot make this change more than once, twice, five times, it means you can make it an infinite number of times. Mm -hmm. Is that not throwing the law itself into chaos? And so also, uh, we also have a, a situation um, regarding marriages. So what happens if, for example, you have a, a male who transitions into a female and a, another male is dating this now female 
and they choose to get married under the, and the male is choosing to get married under the notion that he's going to start a family and realizes that his partner is not actually female as, as a male, what recourse does that person have? I mean, he's basically possibly thrown away his whole, his whole future. Well, again, there are, there are so many issues. The, the, the law as it stands today, our, our gender identity law, actually, again, let me speak uh, about myself as an individual, okay? It prevents me, as a citizen of Malta, from, if I know that you, for example, I know you, and I, I know you as a male, and you go ahead and you change your gender identity. I am bound by secrecy to my family, to my friends, that I cannot tell anyone that you have changed your gender identity. I cannot tell them. So if you are dating another friend of mine or a member of my family, I cannot tell them because if I tell them I'm breaking the law and I can be fined up to, I believe, 5,000 euros. So even though you know that I have transitioned, you... And the I, law says that I cannot, I cannot disclose that information. So I have to keep that information, I have to withhold that information from my own, my own family members, from my own friends. And if a friend of mine asks me... Or, a, mem know, or a, member, a member of your family asks Or a you. member of my family. I have to say, I cannot answer that question, because if I answer that question, I will be incriminating myself. Maybe that's I'm, the best way to answer the question. <laughs> and so, on a legal aspect, isn't that a violation of the freedom of speech? This is interesting, because another principle of law is what happens when one law says something and another law might say something else. We call it conflict of laws. Right. We see this a lot in international law, um, also international private law, but it also exists, of course, in national legislation that you can have conflicts of different laws now. Um, and of course, this creates a problem. And this is why laws have to be uh, very clearly and cleverly thought out and, and um, written. Because one law can give rise to a conflict with another law. I mentioned, I started the program by saying, according to the civil law, a minor is a person under 18. But according to the gender identity law, a minor is under 16. Mm. According to the defilement of minors law under the criminal code, it's also under 16. So could this give rise to a conflict um, of interpretations, a conflict of laws? And there are other things that, of course, you just mentioned, there could be a conflict. Mm. There could be a conflict with um, freedom of speech, yes. There could be a, a conflict um, of, for example, okay, again, Myself as an example, um, let's say I have children, teenagers. If they are still teenagers, they are minors and therefore I am still the, their legal guardian. So I have obligations towards them. If one of them asks me, what do you know about such and such a person? I heard a rumor that maybe that person had a gender identity change, a sex change, etc. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Now imagine I do know. Do, not, do I not have an obligation as a guardian to my own child exactly. to tell that child of mine for his or her uh, uh, benefit? Because knowledge, knowledge is a benefit. No, you, you, you have the benefit of knowledge. That's right. Not to withhold that information. Do I not have an obligation as, as, as a guardian? However, the, the gender identity prevents me. So there could be a conflict of laws, yes. And so... In terms of sticking with the parents issue now, do parents have um, a right to know if a child has, is choosing to, to, to transition? Because in many instances, um, spe specifically in North America, legislation is written in such a way that parents don't even have to be notified of a child's decision to, be, to transition. And is that the case in Malta as well? Well, the position is that um, I, I would have to check whether it it's refers to those persons on, uh, over 16. Because right. as I said, the definition is actually under 16. Right. So if I'm not mistaken, if the, the child has reached 16 years of age, then the child can take a decision. Mm -hmm. Um, without the consent of the parent. But I would have to check the details. But certainly under 16, then definitely not. 
under 16, all the laws in Malta see that person as a minor and right. therefore the any change cannot take place without the consent of the guardians, without the consent of the parents. So I believe the cutoff point is 16. I was going to pose a, a hypothetical question to you because in terms of um, contract law, one cannot engage into a contract with a minor under the age of 18, correct? So if someone who is... Without the consent of the parents. Right. No? So yeah. if someone is above... You need six, parental consent. Right. So if someone is above 16, between the ages of 16 and 18, and chooses to do a transition surgery, I would assume that they would have to sign off a waiver of some form to indemnify a hospital of any situation which may occur during the surgery. But this person is still a minor between the ages of 16 and 18. Is there, would there be some type of legal um, situation where that hospital or that, that organization could be on the hook for something that were, were to go wrong? Because because the, the, the agreement, the contract occurred with is a being signed with a 16 year old exactly. who is of the age of consent pursuant to the um, the gender identity uh, law, but not of the age of consent exactly. to sign contracts according to contract law. Exactly. There you go. We have a situation. That could be a, that could be a situation. Mm -hmm. That could possibly be a situation, yes. But as I said, I would have to check because I don't remember, uh, according to memory, whether um, the law says that at 16, you don't need your parent, uh, parents consent to right. to uh, to do that. It could be that that would still be 18. If it happens to be 16, then yes, there would be a conflict. Mm -hmm. There would be a, pot a, a, a possible problem for sure. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, there are so many other issues. For example, there's also another principle in law which talks about um, the, the law of precedent, the principle of precedent. Once, once you lay down a precedent, uh, a specific principle, you can then start applying that same principle across the board to other um, uh, sections right. of law. Now, what comes to mind is if, with regard to identity, you give so much power and discretion to the individual to state, okay, and we are putting this as, but in some countries, um, uh, including it in, in uh, constitutions and fundamental rights, the fundamental right to, to perceive a different gender, to what extent could one then an, eventually apply that right to, for example, the right of a U.S. citizen who, according to the passports, the U.S. passports today, give you um, a box where you have to tick your race or ethnicity. Mm -hmm. it's, I believe it's called, actually called race, not ethnicity. And you've got Native American, assuming you've, you hold a U.S. passport. Right. Native American, Caucasian, um, Afro-American, uh, Asian, and lo and behold... Um, also Hispanic. Why do I say that? Because we in Europe understand Hispanics to be also Caucasians. But the US law is actually differentiating between what they consider to be Caucasian. So you tick as Caucasian. But if you're Hispanic, you don't tick the box of Caucasian, you tick Hispanic. Mm. So what if I am a Hispanic citizen? and say, I want to be ticked as Caucasian. Well, it's an I have a right because I perceive myself as Caucasian. Right. Now, why did I give this example? Because they can prove already biologically that at least that is how we perceive them in Europe, that Hispanics are also Caucasian. Since time immemorial, we have considered Hispanics as Caucasian, mm -hmm. um, Arabs as Caucasian. That's they right. fall under the Caucasian. So they would have an even stronger case but let us use another example. What if they say, well, maybe I'm quarter uh, Afro, uh, Afro uh, American. I want to identify as Afro American. Right. Or maybe an Afro American is, is um, uh, mixed, okay? Partly Afro um, and partly uh, Caucasian. Now I identify as Caucasian. So does that not give the right to the individual to dictate to the state I perceive myself either as Caucasian or as Asian, or et cetera, et cetera. 
Well, you see, it's, it's, it's complicating life it a lot. Why, why, why are we putting such an emphasis on giving people's rights to identify as gender and not also to exactly. identify as race? Because even race is, is a fundamental um, principle which is enshrined in our fundamental that's right. rights. No, you, you cannot discriminate right. against race. We have age, so, age as well. Why exactly. can't, if, if you can identify as a certain gender, and then why can't you identify as a certain race, as a certain age? Because anti-discrimination law is uh, is based on several aspects. Some, some, uh, many of them, for example, some of them being race, gender, and age, as well as others. Um, for example, um, even um, physical characteristics. So, so if you're handicapped, for example, you cannot discriminate. So why can't I identify as someone who is handicapped, for that matter? It's it's strange how we have focused this this act, this Gender Identity and Characteristics Act, only on sexuality, because a person can identify as many things, age, gender, any animate object, for example, I can identify as maybe an animal, if I wish to. I think this is where it gets interesting from a legal, uh, academic point of view, but also from a practical, of course, <laughs> in regulating society, is that once the law introduces the notion of perception, then it becomes relative. Now, if you look at all the laws, the body of laws over the last few centuries, we've tried to avoid that. The law has tried to avoid that. The law likes to have things in black and white. Mm -hmm. It likes to have things a bit more uh, regimentalized. The moment you bring in subjectivity, because perception is subjective, so the moment you bring in either subjectivity or perception, you, you're, you're, um, you're, you're playing with the law in such a way that the law has, has not been developed over the, the last few centuries in that way. We've because never... we have always tried, look, look at, for example, forensic law. Forensic law is based upon science. No? Science is obviously dependent upon observation. That's right. But the whole idea is that the observation is objective, it's not consistent. subjective. That's right. It's consistent. It's consistent. That is, it is an objective. That's the whole idea. The, That's moment, right. the moment science becomes very subjective, then you're going down a very different route. You're going down a rabbit hole because there's, you're going there's down no a rabbit hole. Law has always tried to be as objective as possible. But once you bring in the subjective and you say, well, if I perceive differently, then I'm going to change. This is why we've We've asked so many questions today. If I subjectively consider myself to be a female and I'm in a male prison, what are the consequences well, if I'm then going to be transferred to a female prison? If I, if I start to participate in, in female sports? If you're going to legislate based on perception, the logical, um, the logical end to that conclusion is that you legislate on the individual. One individual has one one law, another individual has another law. Because if it's based on perception, my perception is different than yours, it's different from someone else's. So I could I could yes, yes. perceive the law my own way. You can perceive the law this your is own why, way. This is why it's a dangerous, it, it, well, uh, let's not use the word dangerous. It's a very delicate um, situation and, and, and a very complex one. And that is why I, I used the example uh, for, for race. If an American citizen states, listen, on my passport, and Maltese passports, we don't have it. No, we don't have a list of race, but the Americans do. They say, I identify as a Caucasian. I identify as this. As then, so this is the whole point. They say, well, with gender, that's already the case. So imagine they'll make a constitutional case challenging the way the US passports are being, um, are, are listing race and say, but you are impinging on my rights because I perceive myself to be different. If mm -hmm. I am, for example, half Caucasian and half uh, Afro-American, or half Caucasian and half um, Asian or whatever, who is going to decide right. what and I am? We also run the risk. Is it because it's a question of looks? Because then they say, yes, but a question of looks, look at the gender laws. Right. The gender law says that this is still my perception because I perceive my looks differently. Exactly. So you are an immigration officer. You are the, 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 the foreign department issuing 
passports. And you consider myself, you consider me Asian because I look a bit Asian, but I don't, I consider that I look more Caucasian than Asian. So again, you see, it's, it's, it's very subjective. The law doesn't like things that are very and we also based run, on subject. We run the, 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 the risk of players gaming, gaming the system, because if we have those type of laws in place where it's based on perception, I could easily game, for example, gender quotas. If, if I wish to enter into a prestigious university which has gender quotas, I can simply say, well, I identify as uh, a handicapped black um, lesbian, for example, and because of the, the hierarchy, I could easily be um, accepted into that's true some you know you have these players who are go trying to game the system that's always going to occur well it, it always happens with every law that people try to look for loopholes right. in the laws for their for, for, for personal, personal advantage, gain yes. or, or whatever for advantages so that's always the case with all laws that is why laws have to really work to try to avoid having loopholes in the first place and unfortunately this there seem to be a lot of this loopholes. This one's riddled with loopholes. A lot of loopholes. So this is not a question of being anti or pro anything. Right. You know, I mean, we, we respect individuals. I have always respected individuals of any color, creed or sex, uh, religion, religious belief, etc. So essentially, uh, that has not changed. But we need to be realistic and see when there are loopholes in the laws that are being changed. You know, what are the consequences? Right. We, need to, we need to be brave enough as a society to ask the right questions and to look for the correct answers right. and, not, and not jump on a bandwagon because this happens to be politically correct and because you have right. to be careful not to offend someone. We, we're not here to offend anyone. We're not here to say that people don't have their fundamental rights, their rights to, to their own perceptions, and their rights to be treated equally under the law, because that is the basis of society, of, of democratic society, to be treated equally under the law. That is what is important. Now, how a person identifies, to what extent is that going to be uh, a person not being treated equally under the law? It, it, it's regardless of how you identify, you should be treated equally under the law. Mm -hmm. So by that argument, again, uh, go back to the US passport, you say, if I'm treated equally under the law, why should you list me as as uh, Hispanic or Afro-American? Because if I'm treated equally under the law and all US citizens are the same, why are you putting it in the passport? Why categorize it in the first why place? Why are you categorizing? So I can see an argument that we shouldn't categorize. It makes a lot of sense because categorization tends to lead to discrimination uh, and not being treated equally. That's right, law. to marginalization. But now what we're talking about is, no, we want to have 70, we want to recognize <laughs> 74 categories. So I think that human rights should be moving towards having less categorization rather than more. Because the less categorization you have, the more likely you are to have people treated equally under the law. Exactly. The more you categorize, the more you run the risk of actually having the opposite effect of that intended. That's right. So, well, I think we can end here. Um, I hope you've enjoyed our debate. We've tried to raise a number of questions. We're not here to state opinions and uh, try to indoctrinate people and so on. But I think people need to go back to these questions and try to figure out all the answers. That means as individuals, as citizens, but also obviously as policymakers um, and as lawmakers. Thank you very much, and we wish you all a very good day. Thanks, Rudolf.